I became that guy in Nick Hornsby 1995 novel, High Fidelity, an obsessive compulsive pop music snob. Like so many, I was convinced that the hidden messages of popular music had to be protected from the grubby fingers of those for whom pop music was simply entertainment. Songwriters were, I was convinced, talking to one another, which is why I became more interested in the history of American popular music songwriters than in singers or bands. Did it ever occur to me that those structures I heard and saw in my head might be projections of my own affective turmoil? Probably. But like so many other intimations of adulthood, I airily dismissed the warnings. It would be years before I could accept that it was okay to invent meanings, that my interpretations did not necessarily have to align with those who understood lyrics and music better than I ever could. At the same time, I was wary of the fanciful flights of the imagination untethered to any object or idea on this earth. I had to find a middle way, and it was poetry that provided the means of the mean striking a fluctuating balance between understanding and creativity. These two facets of poetry were, I was convinced, speaking and responding to one another every time I read a poem. Is this why I am attracted to poem 21 of the Lost Poems of George Oppen, the only one included in discrete series Here's the untitled poem in this original form. Well, doesn't mean anything because you can't see it, but the mass inaudibly soars, bowl like tapering, sail flattens beneath the wind, the limp water holds the boat's round sides, sun slants dry light on the deck, beneath us glide rocks, sand, and unrimmed holes. Perhaps this open poem merely triggered a memory when I came across it long after I had read all of Eliot. Specifically, the open poem echoed for me the end of the penultimate stanza of part five, what the thunder said of the wasteland. Quote, Damyata, the boat responded gaily to the hand expert with sail and oar. The sea was calm, your heart would have responded gaily when invited beating obedient to controlling hands. In other words, if I believed that these, that these passages from two different poets with different though interrelated concerns were answering one another in advance and in retrospect, is that simply because the concept of the answer sung or call and response was merely in my head as well as in history? Once you believe in the answer song and call and response, you hear echoes and correspondences everywhere. For someone like that, history is no longer, no longer appears as a linear chronicle and narrative. Instead, history as such dissolves into a network of voices resonating across the ages, counterpoint after counterpoint always on the verge of cacophony. <clears throat> 